Well, good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon and welcome to Crawford School. Welcome to the ANU. For those of you uh, who traveled, welcome to Canberra. Um, my name is Frank Yotzo. I'm the director of the Center for Energy and Climate Policy here uh, at the Crawford School uh, and very much looking forward uh, to, to our one and a half hours of discussion, uh, discussions about uh, long-term strategies for low emissions internationally and in Australia. I'd like to start by uh, acknowledging the Ngunnawal people on whose traditional lands we meet. Uh, and to acknowledge their elders past, present, uh, and emerging. And thinking about the indigenous heritage uh, of this continent um, may very well put us in the right frame of mind to think about long-term strategies for climate change and emissions reductions. Um, obviously, we don't need to necessarily think in time frames of 30,000 to 50,000 years, but it does pay to think in time frames of 30 to 50 years uh, rather than uh, three to five years when we think about decarbonizing uh, our economy. That is a process that will take place over the next few decades. Um, we need to understand deeply the options, the opportunities, the pressure points, um, how we can go about this process to maximize opportunity uh, for economic prosperity, how we can go about that uh, process to in a way that, uh, that uh, leverages new technologies and investment in the best way possible, and how we go about that process that minimizes adjustment pressures and pain for local communities where some uh, economic activities will uh, inevitably uh, wane while others rise. Um, so the context uh, for all of this, uh, and, and I'll come back to that, and, and our various speakers will come back to that, um, is the Paris Agreement, uh, which calls on all nations to prepare a strategy uh, for long-term low emissions um, in, in each nation. Um, there's an expectation that countries, uh, governments, will submit such strategies this year in the lead up to the climate conference at Glasgow in, in November COP26. Um, you could very well say that this is not just an issue for national governments, but also for subnational governments. All Australian states and territories have targets or goals or maybe statements of intent to reach net zero emissions by 2050 uh, or earlier. Uh, not all of the states and territories have a very clear plan or strategy as to how that should be achieved. Uh, and this year of all years is actually a very good opportunity uh, to put in place uh, steps uh, towards that. In all of that, the business community has a very important uh, role to play. Uh, very much of the investment um, will uh, be made by industry, by businesses, and will be decided um, by, uh, by people who, uh, who have the, the power to decide the allocation of funds in, in the finance industry. Civil society, obviously, very, very important as well. Um, uh, the, the, the shift to net zero emissions um, will have ramifications for consumers uh, and for communities. So today on all of these things, uh, we will hear perspectives uh, from Anna Skarbek, who is the CEO of Climate Works Australia, research think tank affiliated with Monash University, Erwin Jackson, who's the policy director of the Investor Group on Climate Change, uh, a peak body for um, entities, organizations, companies in the finance industry with a very large amount of money uh, uh, under management. Uh, Tennant Reid, who is the head of climate, energy and environmental policy for the Australian Industry Group. Um, and we'll start out um, with my colleague, uh, Nerali Abram, from the Research School of Earth Sciences, where she's a professor there, uh, to remind us uh, of, of why we actually care uh, about uh, reducing greenhouse gas emissions. So please welcome Nerali. Right, um, well, thank you for, for being here today. So, so my job is to, to set the context um, as to, to why we need to have this discussion about emission reductions. Uh, so, uh, this is the Australian temperature record for um, the last 110 years, so beginning in 1910. 
Um, and what you can see there is a very clear uh, warming trend. And what we can see at the very end of that graph um, is the highest and the, the reddest bar. So 2019 was Australia's hottest year on record. Uh, it was also Australia's driest year on record, and I'm sure I don't need to remind um, you of the terrible impacts that we've seen um, this summer. Um, so I just wanted to, to show a, a little bit of an animation, um, just to put into context uh, the, the impacts that we've seen this summer with bushfires. So 2019 was our hottest year on record. It was also our driest year on record. So, um, so what, what this animation is showing um, is um, on the, the bottom axis is the, the precipitation that re is received in southern Australia. Um, and on the, the y axis, the vertical axis, is the, the average maximum temperature in Australia. And then plotted on this as well are the years when we've seen um, large bushfires, large forest fires in Australia, so where more than a million acres has been burnt. And so what you see um, when you plot this data up is that there's a very clear relationship in Australia between um, hot years also being dry years, cool years being wet years. Um, and then we can also see that progression as we go up that, um, the colour scale towards more recent decades where we see the, the average temperature rising um, and then we see that very extreme, um, the very extreme conditions that we experienced in 2019 um, moving into 2020 and then the, the impacts that we saw associated with that very extreme year. Go again. Right, so, so um, it was Australia's hottest year on record. Um, and what I wanted to show here is how that fits in terms of a global context. So the curve that's now plotted on here is the global mean temperature. And this is expressed relative to the period from 1850 to 1900. So that's our typical pre-industrial period. And so this is on a, on a scale where we can start to now directly compare with the targets that we hear about in the Paris Agreement. So the Paris Agreement has that ambition that we want to limit warming to um, below two degrees and to pursue efforts to limit warming to 1.5 degrees. And so that's that top um, dark gray shaded area at the top of that graph. So you can see that we're, we're already at one degree of global warming. That extreme that we've seen in Australia in 2019 is the type of extreme condition that we can get with one degree of global warming. We would expect those extremes um, in Australia to be even more intense um, when we get to those um, thresholds that we hear talked about in the Paris Agreement. Uh, so, um, if current warming trends continue, then we expect that we'll reach 1.5 degrees as soon as 2030, so only 10 years away, um, and um, up to sort of 2052 being the range of estimates on that. So that was an assessment made as part of the IPCC special report uh, on 1.5 degrees of warming. And we have choices for the end of this century, depending on how ambitious, how urgent, how coordinated we are in terms of our emission reductions. So if we are able to pursue a low greenhouse gas emission pathway um, with a high mitigation, so in scientific terms, we would refer to that scenario for the future as RCP 2.6 then by the end of this century, we would expect that we'd be living in a world where on the global average temperature was around about 1.6 degrees above pre-industrial. So within that, that um, target range that we're um, hoping to restrict warming to through the Paris Agreement. On um, the, the other high end of those choices, um, if we continue on a high greenhouse gas emission future um, without policies to combat climate change, so an RCP 8.5 scenario, then by the end of the century, we would expect warming of around 4.3 degrees Celsius. So I think sometimes it's, it's quite easy to think of these numbers um, as still being sort of relatively small, sort of what's four degrees, but then I think um, what I'd like people to do is to bring that back to the context that the summer that we've just witnessed is the type of extreme event that we get with one degree of warming. So if we continue on a high emission pathway, we don't get um, emission reduction action happening, um, then this is the, the type of direction that we could be headed for. And with the, the current pledges that we have through the Paris Agreement, we're on track for around about three degrees of warming um, if those um, agreements are, are held to.
So I, I already sort of talked about the, the bushfires, but it's important to, to remember that there, there's a whole range of impacts that we will see with climate change and that we're already seeing with one degree of warming. And the scientific message on this is a very simple one. Uh, the, the higher that we let warming go, the more intense we expect these impacts to be. So for example, for the, the Great Barrier Reef, um, we're um, on the brink of potentially the third mass bleaching event in five years at the moment. And if we let global warming continue to 1.5 degrees, then we would expect that the Great Barrier Reef that we know today will be very different and large parts of it may not exist anymore. We're already seeing um, the impacts of extreme sea level events um, along affecting our coastlines. By the middle of the century, we could expect what was previously a once in 100 year extreme event uh, to be an annual event along our coastlines. Uh, we also see impacts through strengthening of storms, both tropical cyclones and extra tropical storms, and the associated flooding risk that we have with those. So there's a whole range of reasons why uh, we want to try and avoid some of these worst case scenarios in terms of impacts. And the very, very simple takeaway message is that every fraction of a degree matters. We're at one degree, we're already seeing what those impacts look like and how hard they hit us personally and, and our societies and our economies and our ecosystems. Um, and so, so that's why um, this type of um, meeting is so important for actually mapping those um, ways that we can actually take the action that's required to get us onto that low emission pathway and to limit the future impacts that we'll be facing. Thanks. Thank you very much, Nirili. And uh, we'll hold questions for our discussion um, at, at the end. Um, uh, we will have, I, I promise, this is my pledge, we will have plenty of time um, to, uh, to talk. So I've already mentioned uh, the Paris Agreement um, uh, calls on, on all countries to submit long-term uh, low emissions uh, strategies, uh, and we, we will see this reverberating quite strongly this year in the lead up uh, to the COP26 um, Conference of Parties. And many countries, in fact, have already submitted uh, their own um, low emissions uh, strategies or long term uh, emission strategies. Um, one document that I think uh, should be of particular interest and, and importance to Australia is the recently released UK uh, long term uh, emission strategy because, you know, no doubt. Um, you know, uh, the UK will be placing very strong emphasis um, on, uh, on, on other countries submitting such documents in the lead up to the conference of parties that the UK are hosting uh, with a conservative government that is placing very strong emphasis on progressive climate change policy. Uh, and we can only imagine that there are some interesting conversations um, uh, happening bilaterally there as well between uh, the UK and Australia. Um, other strategies, including, of course, a US one uh, submitted in 2016. Various European countries, Japan, Canada, have all uh, submitted such strategies. Some of the um, uh, less major economies uh, have as well. And that's, of course, in the context uh, of various jurisdictions having, um, having espoused uh, net zero emissions targets. Now, uh, if you want to put together your own uh, long-term uh, emission strategy, then there's a very useful resource that you can refer to as produced by the 2050 Pathways platform, which is a, uh, an international uh, initiative uh, to support countries in the preparation uh, of such strategies um, uh, and to acknowledge that uh, this organization is also supporting some of our work um, over the course of, of this year. Um, I should also mention that uh, we know uh, with quite high confidence that China is preparing uh, a long-term emission strategy uh, and that is, to be, uh, that is expected to be released before COP26 um, as well. Strategy like that encompasses uh, very many different uh, elements. So it should not just be a technical analysis of how we can drive the carbon emissions, other greenhouse gas emissions um, out of the economic system, 
Um, it should also encompass uh, a thorough analysis of what this means economically, what it means socially, um, and what the, what the vision is um, of an economy that runs on net zero emissions. So it's not really you know, the difference between um, a, a business as usual, right, uh, and the net zero emission and what that might shave off GDP, right? This is a question that we often get asked by journalists, right? Comparing these two um, uh, hypothetical uh, options for 30, 40 years down the track uh, is not really a very sense, uh, useful question to ask. The useful question to ask is, what will our economy look like? What will our regions look like um, in a future where we take advantage of low carbon or zero carbon growth um, opportunities. The pillars of decarbonization, you know, thinking about a systematic way of, of, of uh, splicing that up are firstly, a zero carbon electricity supply or a near zero carbon electricity supply. I actually like to talk about 98 or 99 percent renewables for Australia rather than 100 percent renewables because you now having a few gas turbines and diesel engines even in the background for when you need them makes the job so much easier. Um, once you have all of that emissions free electricity, you can use that to displace direct fossil fuel use in all manner of other sectors, electrification, electrify everything electrify transport as far as possible, electric cars, um, hydrogen cars run on hydrogen produced by renewable energy, okay? Um, electrify processes in, in industry, electrify um, heating, etc. cetera, in, in households. Thirdly, processes and products, uh, all manner of grab bag of different things in industry uh, as well as in agriculture. And that's horses for courses, what you can do in terms of product and process substitution uh, and te technological improvements, efficiency improvements. And lastly, negative emissions. Negative emissions technologies uptake in the landscape, but also technological carbon uptake from the atmosphere. Those are the ingredients for net zero emissions outcome. Is it possible? Uh, yes, of course it's possible. Uh, I won't dwell on this, but as a first cut in terms of the opportunities uh, for Australia, uh, zero carbon electricity supply is actually really easy for our country. We've got um, a, an electricity system that runs still over 60% on coal, about 75% overall on fossil fuels, but we've got tremendous opportunities and that shift is already happening to renewables bolstered by storage and a better transmission system. That shift is underway and we can confidently predict that by the middle of the century, if not earlier, uh, we will have um, a, a near zero emissions electricity system. That allows us electrification everywhere else. Some difficult questions about electrification in industry uh, and in heavy transport. Processing products, very complicated picture uh, and we expect to hear more about that in the government's uh, low carbon technology roadmap which is slated for release, we hear, in the very near future. Um, and finally, negative emissions. Australia, once again, in a very good position, actually, to provide very large amounts of negative carbon dioxide emissions through uptake in the land, afforestation, uh, returning marginal grazing lands to carbon lands, and also technologically, if we're thinking, um, energy-driven carbon uptake um, through technical means. So Australia actually really quite well placed to get there uh, and, and potentially go below zero. Can it be done? Well, this is the uh, 2014 analysis um, that uh, Climate Works Australia, Anna and I led this um, uh, together with very many others who contributed to the analysis. That was the net zero uh, scenario that we published in 2014. Um, and uh, to our delight and somewhat surprise, this was actually reported on in the Australian newspaper yesterday. Um, <laughs> only six years late, um, <laughs> but you know, um, that's okay. Um, it's just that the picture um, that we painted then was massively too pessimistic, okay? So if you redid that now, uh, you would expect a much lower level of residual positive emissions and hence a much lower level of required negative emissions to get to net zero, okay? And the key to that really is that we know that zero carbon renewable electricity supply is so much cheaper right already now than we thought back then it would be in 2030 or 2040 okay so this is this is getting really really quite easy okay we don't want to be flippant about it but it's nowhere near as hard as we might have thought five six years ago as an illustration okay as an illustration this is just purely playing with some numbers if you reduced um, electricity sector uh, emissions by 95%, right, and then electrified, and then 
uh, you know, reduced remaining emissions by various percentage rates that are on the slide, right, then you would end up in this example, right, at some point in time, right, we're not making any judgment about when that is, with remaining net emissions of maybe 100 and in this slide, 180 megatons or so, right? I see some people nodding, I see some people shaking their heads. And you know, this is the analysis that is needed in terms of the technological basis for that um, and, the, and the economic basis for it uh, as well. Of course, the lights won't go out uh, when, we, when, we, uh, when, when we do these things because you know, a prerequisite for that is, of course, a, a solid and um, reliable uh, energy and electricity supply. Right? Uh, yeah. We have the institutions to, uh, to make sure that, uh, that all of these things go, go smoothly. Um, we can think of much stronger scenarios as well, which then means a lesser need um, for, for negative emissions to balance remaining positive emissions. Um, this is the kind of a, you know, um, a transformation that you would see in each and every of the Australian states and territories. Okay? Um, but the, the emissions uh, profile uh, in different parts of the country looks very different, obviously, right? And hence the solutions for getting towards net zero look very different as well. Um, and so there's a strong case for, for states and territories to quite actively get involved in the creation of, of analysis and creation of strategies um, uh, for, for long-term emissions outcomes. Now, the energy transition as such is underway and, you know, I think it's fair to say this is not a comment necessarily on, on Australia, but most governments probably feeling like um, that, that ride that they are bravely got on the horse uh, and, and, and maybe feeling like it's not going too well right now. It's happening, right? But it's, it's kind of a bit difficult to control, okay? Um, and so hence, hence the need for, for much more planning, visioning, uh, and, and collaborations between the different entities that are involved there. You know, collectively, I think it's fair to say the Australian um, you know, institutional um, environment and, and the various actors have spent over the last decade or so far too much energy uh, brawling and, 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 and fighting political battles than to actually, you know, um, concentrate on the perhaps 80 or 90 percent that most everyone can agree on um, and, and, and taking that forward. Um, just on the economics, the typical kind of, you know, uh, way the trade-offs are presented in terms of the costs of reducing emissions versus the benefits from avoided climate change damages, right? And that's, of course, where the free-riding argument comes in then as well. We're a small country. What if we can't affect what anyone else does? And then you kind of muddle with the discussion. In reality, of course, there's very extensive benefits that accrue outside of the pure climate benefits from putting the economy um, on, a, on a clean energy and, and clean in, in industry footing. Some of them uh, are what we call co-benefits of mitigation, right? This is sort of just a preview of some work that's going on. Paul Weirwald is leading that here uh, at Crawford School. Um, all manner of local benefits that can be harnessed um, from the, uh, from, you know, technologies and practices that uh, ultimately serve to reduce greenhouse gas emissions, but that also have these various um, local uh, co-benefits, be they social, be they environmental, um, be they uh, economic. Um, we know that you know, the process and elements of, of long-term emissions strategies best um, comprise a number of elements. We need to really understand what the scenarios are. We need some modeling. I think Tenant will share some thoughts about the use and misuse of economic uh, modeling with us later, right? Uh, we need an agreement, right? We need some agreement, at least on the fundamentals between the key institutions, actors, um, and an agreement on, on processes. Um, we then need to uh, implement, right? And, and the implementation needs to be assessed. Some other countries have formal structures for annual monitoring of process with energy transition, process towards emissions reduction goals. Um, those are good things, and those are things that, that we would recommend adding uh, to the Australian toolbox. Um, I'll leave it there, uh, and I will now call on Anna Skarbek uh, to share uh, latest thinking and uh, I think maybe some um, sneak preview uh, of, of, of research results there at ClimateWorks. Anna, welcome. <laughs> Thank you. And is this my clicker? Yeah, that's great. Right. 
Thanks, Frank. Hello, everybody. Um, and it is a great segue for me to follow Frank uh, as we did work together five years ago on the deep decarbonisation pathways for Australia. And Frank has outlined those sorts of trade-offs and, and sector-based analyses that's necessary in looking at it as a whole economy. And my team have spent the last year updating the underlying technology data that fed into that and looking at the progress in technology since then. Um, and we'll be able to release all of that detail very, very soon. So that has informed my remarks today. If you don't know Climate Works Australia, we are uh, based at Monash University, set up as a bridge between research and action uh, to help business and government implement what the research is showing is possible and necessary. So the, the way we've looked at this analysis builds on what we did five years ago and takes the scenarios approach that indeed financial regulators are asking all uh, financial institutions and companies to take uh, through TCFD and other frameworks. And this is to show that we know, as Frank has outlined and we showed five years ago, the technology is available. It's about how do we accelerate its uptake. And what we have shown is that there are different ways to accelerate uptake and different policies mean some technologies respond in different ways. Pricing, regulation, the, the gap in market behaviour Sometimes depends on upfront cost, other times depends on motivation, other times depends on availability. There are lots of different reasons why technology rollout isn't happening at the pace required and policy can, can target that. So can the pace of technology improvement and so can the pace of sentiment, consumer demand or social shift. So we built into our model an ability to dial up or down each of those drivers, assuming that there's an external driver. So technology improvement, dial it up fast due to uh, um, targeted uh, policy or in um, other market demand. Similarly, consumer sentiment, moving away from high emissions uh, products towards low emissions products. Um, and policy itself, which can be economy-wide, for example, pricing or regulating emissions, or incentivising um, the reduction. So we build a tool that can enable uh, all the technology mix to be played within that way. And what we've shown, um, as Frank alluded to, is that we can, uh, in Australia, and this is looking just at the domestic economy, not the export economy, um, the technology mis mix is still available for Australia to achieve net zero emissions within the carbon budget that the science requires for two degrees and for 1.5. What we show in this analysis here in the, the triangle diagram is that to achieve it within the 1.5 diagram, all of those drivers need to be dialed up to their full strength in the, in the way we assessed it. Whereas with the others, you can see there's a bit of a trade-off. If some area goes a little slower, another area could go faster and make up for some of that. We're talking there, by making up, we're talking about years of progress. And as we heard from Nerily, that does bake in years more of warming and therefore the risks and impacts of physical climate change that come from that. So I've alluded there that that's the first key finding. The second key finding is that um, we will still need further breakthroughs because all of those scenarios rely on negative emissions, carbon forestry most substantially. And that's what makes up for the lack of technological progress on the residual emissions. So even when we're dialing up technology process progress on the known technologies, we need to be um, vastly scaling up carbon sequestration through forestry and vegetation to buy us time to also scale up the R&D for the residual emissions. And as I mentioned, the pace of scaling up of technology, if it outperforms, can make up for some of the lost ground on weaker emissions policy signals. But if we want to achieve 1.5 instead of 2 degrees warming, um, which we know from the science is two degrees is exponentially worse than one and a half. Uh, to do that, we can't afford any of the areas to be going slower than what they could. It's all in. And as I mentioned, the policy responses can and should be tailored for each technology maturity type and in each sector. So we've heard already from Frank the broad basket of technologies. And when we looked at it again five years later, broadly, they are still the same. The four pillars of decarbonisation still hold. What has improved is some of the technologies that were not considered known and proven when we looked at it five years ago now are in the mix in a way that they weren't. 
Um, 100% renewables, Frank's already discussed. Um, indeed, there are a number of ways to get to 100% renewables, and, and when we bring in the export economy, which we haven't done, it's likely that Australia would produce um, 200 to 700% renewables if we want to be exporting energy. That's not the subject of today's conversation, but just to keep that in mind, that 100 is really the floor rather than the ceiling in this on electricity. In buildings, let's not overlook deep energy efficiency. It's a very known technology, and our data shows that emission energy use in buildings can halve per square metre with technologies that are already available. So the question there is deployment. How do you roll it out in what is quite a fragmented asset replacement task? LED lights have fallen in cost by 80% in five years, as one example. Electric heat pumps um, are five times more efficient than gas for heating a house or a building. So all of this stuff actually pays for itself in terms of no net additional cost, roughly. But of course, it's not no upfront cost. So that's where you want to tailor your policy to allow the market to bring in that technology when the, when the customer inertia behaviour may not choose it, even when economically it would be a cost-effective decision as well as an emissions-effective decision. Uh, in transport, there's been a lot of progress on the technological front. Um, and so now for road transport, which is where 80% of Australia's transport emissions are, roughly half passenger, half freight on that road share, another 10% is aviation and a tenth everything else. Electrification is now viable in all of those realms in a way it wasn't. Even for short haul aviation, there are venture capital firms in Australia investing in electric planes that already operate. It looks like that might become a short haul option, as it is for electric ferries, which are now making their maiden journeys. Um, similarly for trucks, the electrification of cars is making the electrification of trucks or at least larger batteries more promising, or there's a fuel cell opportunity to use hydrogen. So there it's a twin track policy approach. Deploy the known technologies, and in, um, I'll come to electric vehicle cars in a moment, but keep the development going for those emerging ones. And then for the long haul, we'll need syn fuels or biofuels where electric batteries can't do the job. And we've got again the opportunity for hydrogen and ammonia. And lastly to industry here on this, that final line there, a very uh, emerging area of technological progress is the circular economy. So this is um, material substitution, rather than we talk about cradle to grave, we're talking about round and around in circular. Um, so looking at recycling source materials um, to reuse, uh, we're seeing much more product stewardship now than previously, We've got a long way to go still. But that will affect demand for raw materials, especially when the trend is global, which is something we uh, model in one of the scenarios, which affects what we export, uh, but it also allows us to manufacture things differently. So 3D printing, for example, the market for 3D printers has doubled in the last five years. That changes radically how much uh, energy we would use in, in producing energy intensive manufactured goods, whether it be metals or plastics, for example. And of course, let's not overlook energy efficiency again. The same holds in industry. Australia ranks second bottom in the OECD for energy efficiency in industrial energy use. Um, and the opportunity for electrification is improving day by day. So that's where, again, policy is deployment for the known technologies, yet it's a fragmented task still, and sometimes quite specific to particular industry, industrial plants, and when is the moment, the right moment in their asset turnover, for example. Um, and then development still, those electrification opportunities still need quite, quite a lot of um, technological development, and it is worth supporting that to then be a supplier of, in a zero carbon global economy. So a key lesson out of all of this is whilst the technology is there, the pace of uptake significantly accelerates, really significantly, in the scenarios where we get it right and we deploy these technologies at the volumes we would need to stay under the emissions trajectories. So I've just picked two examples here from the upcoming um, analysis from these scenarios. The two scenarios, if you remember those triangles of different ways to stay under two degrees and then the all in of staying under one and a half. Just looking at electric cars, what it means is that um, we would need at least half of all new cars in 10 years time to be EVs if we're staying under two or if we wanna stay under one and a half trajectory, it's three and four cars. Now current uh, national government projections suggest the 
the pathway might be one in five in 10 years from now. But I am aware of some commercial analysis that suggests globally it could be one in two globally in 10 years. The question is how do we get those cars to Australia when we're a small right-hand drive market? So again, tailoring the policy solution to the challenge, to the, to the barrier. That's less a technological development one, but an integration one. And we've talked already about renewables and the pathway, and this just shows that of, of moving faster, getting to a, rather than a 50% roughly share of, of renewables, getting up to three quarters of the market in the next 10 years being renewables in order to enable the rest of the technology mix to decarbonise as well. That's not the only way to get there, as I said, but in these scenarios, this is what the technology costs today would suggest you do first, or at least in this, uh, to this degree, to enable the other mix of technologies to keep us under those emissions budgets. And finally, the R&D for the harder to abate sectors must continue. Now, this sort of technology is not yet readily able to be included in our uh, analysis because the data for deployment and uptake costs is not yet available because this is still an emerging area. So we take this work from our international partners at the Energy Transitions Commission. And just as a colour code there, what's really interesting is that in each of these areas, there are solutions that are available and the types of innovation in blue, it's incremental. Keep doing what we're doing, inch away, get it better. That's a deployment task. Do it lots of times and get better with every time. And the yellow is breakthrough. Think about how to do it differently. We need a step change in the performance of that. So the technology might work, perhaps, but not for the scale we need. So that just looks across there for cement, chemicals, steel, the use of electrification, materials efficiency, um, different versions of concrete, uh, and looking at sin, um, sin fuels and biochemistry. There's a terrific set of analysis on the Energy Transitions Commission uh, site that explores all of this in detail, and we are now working with a large coalition in Australia to bring some of that onshore and see what would it look like for Australia's industries that are relevant to these sectors. So finally, I won't go into a lot of detail, but I think I've been trying to highlight here, there are solutions on the technology side and policy solutions, policy solutions can be tailored to those needs. Whether it's a mature technology, we know it works, it's time to get it into the market. So either set minimum standards, uh, or percentage procurement obligations, that's, that's what's been done with renewable energy targets, minimum standards. The building code was not upgraded for a decade. My team worked with the property sector for three years uh, and longer to help get that through the regulatory approaches. This stuff takes time. And we've only got a decade to halve the emissions um, and to continue on. So, of course, supporting the known solutions, changing the pricing incentives, whether it's emissions pricing, uh, rebasing subsidies, aligning it with emissions, all of these policy options are, are well known. It's about applying them for the solutions that are well known where it's mature. Um, and if there's a substitute that's available, it's time to deploy it. For the demonstration, it's, that means it's premature to, to regulate out the alternative, but what you want to do is pull in the new. And that's where debt targeted grants and financial support or government led procurement insisting that all assets that the government uh, procures, requires, purchases, builds, will use the new forms of, of lower emissions technologies in all the sectors. And emerging is, is much more classically in the R&D and innovation space. That's all I had time to cover for today. There is much more that we can say and, and certainly stay tuned to Climate Works over the coming weeks and months for the rest of all of that detail. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much, Anna. And clearly, the decarbonisation futures report will be one uh, to to watch out for as a as a source of uh, you know technically based information um, uh, to support that that analysis. We've worked out what it is with the lights. It's the automatic um, energy saving device that that turns the lights. We can also think of it as an automatic student wake up device in, in lectures that, that drag on for too long. Um, next, we'll hear from Irvin Jackson. He's the policy director, as I said, for the investor group uh, on climate change. Now, many people, quite a few people in this room um, have got um, have been in this field for a very long time indeed, but I have a sneaking suspicion, Irvin, that you might actually take the gold medal in that regard. I uh, know, Howard's up there. Okay. Right. <laughs> Howard, of course, Howard has been in this long time. Okay. Thank you, Frank. 
Um, and thank you for the invitation to come along. Um, for those who don't know, the Investor Group on Climate Change is a collaboration of institutional investors, um, so your super funds, um, asset managers, asset owners, who work together to, have been working together for the last 15 years or so, focused on the investment community's role in addressing um, this problem. Um, and to give you a bit of a sense of the scale of that, so um, our members in Australia have, it's about $2 trillion of assets under management. Um, and we also collaborate globally with our peers internationally. So again, and that's, that work is accelerating and increasing through time. And to give you another example of the scale of this, so we, we, we organised a letter last year to governments in the lead up to the COP about what they needed to do. Um, and that was signed by investors who have about half of global assets under management. Um, so we're now talking about um, big um, allocators of capital starting to think about this problem. And what I'm hoping to do today is give you a bit of an insight um, a, into the conversations that we've been having about the development of long-term strategy here in Australia, um, but also to give you a few insights into some of the ways that investors are starting to think about this problem, um, both from a, climate change, from a climate change risk and opportunity point of view. Um, so just starting off, I might just start off with a bit of the jargon that investors use. Some of you will be familiar with this, but I think it actually sets a good tone. So the way investors think about the issue of climate change um, is essentially um, from a longer term perspective. Like the fiduciary and legal obligations, um, if you're a long term institutional investor, is essentially to consider how we can make, um, when you retire, you retire with dignity. And the average age of a retiree in Australia um, <clears throat> will be about 2050, if you look at the current age of the people who have super fund, uh, money in super funds. And of course, what we do on climate change will matter a lot to how much money they have in the bank. Uh, in, in 2050. And that really comes through in, in two pathways. One which is around the transition risk um, of climate change, so as governments work to reduce emissions or consumer preferences change or technology costs come down, um, that, tr that creates risks for existing investments in fossil fuels, um, for example, but also creates opportunities for new investments in things like renewables. The other side of the coin, of course, is physical risk. What does the impact of climate change itself mean for long-term investments? Um, and I'll talk about that in a bit more in a, in a minute. Um, and that all then translates to a financial risk. And what we've seen globally over the last few years is really through the work um, which emerged out of the G20's Financial Stability Board around the task force of climate-related financial disclosures is a much stronger focus on trying to identify what these risks are and translating them into real um, and working out how material, how material they are from a financial point of view. Um, so first of all, I might just start off with the basics of the Paris Agreement, because I think one of the things that's really important from an institutional investor's point of view is that um, if you're thinking about making an investment over the next in, in a piece of infrastructure that might be around for 50 years or, or a property development that might be around for 100, um, what the Paris Agreement is actually really important, because what the Paris Agreement does is at heart, it sets a pathway of accelerated action towards net zero emissions. You can argue around the date of that, um, but one of the things that's often lost in the conversation here in Australia is in about three years' time, the government is going to have to start considering what its 2035 target is. And then five years after that, it's going to have to start considering what its 2040 target is. So all of the time, we are going to be ratcheting up ambition. And that sends a really strong signal to the market. And indeed, if I talk to my members, the biggest ones, um, who have been thinking about this for a long time, their central scenario where they think about this issue is a Paris Align scenario. It's not a scenario where the world fumbles along and does nothing. It's a scenario where at some point the world will act to get to net zero emissions. The only question they have is whether that happens in a smooth way and we manage that transition or it's a disruptive way where it's unmanaged and, very, and, and has big impacts on uh, the economy and investments. I think the other important thing is to highlight here is that climate, the risk of climate change is a systemic one. Um, and I'll talk about this a bit more in a second, but. Um, climate change is a risk to the entire economy and indeed to the global economy and this is becoming much clearer in minds of investors and indeed I would probably argue that Australian investment community is probably this is an area in the world where globally we're ahead of our international peers for obvious reasons. We have seen over many years um, impacts of droughts, uh, fires, um, extreme events which has focused the minds of um, Australian investors and indeed what we're actually seeing from the people who are the, and what basically we have a situation at the moment where investors are currently looking around the country 
and saying, in the future, that's where there's going to be a big climate risk. We are not going to invest there. Whereas they're already getting investors saying, we are not going to invest in infrastructure because of the, in the assessments they've done of the impacts of climate change. So this is going to have very important implications about how capital is deployed um, um, in the future, which I'll come to again in a minute. So tying this all together, this work was done by the, um, a, a network of central banks, which is operating globally, which includes the Reserve Bank, and I modified there some of their language. But the key point I want to make here, really, is that from an investor's point of view, climate change is not a risk you can divest from, because it is going to impact every part of the economy. Um, it's, going to have far, it's going to have big impacts, depending on how well we manage the problem. And the decisions we make today will have material impacts on how serious the problem is. And that is going to flow through in terms of both the physical risks of climate change, but also transitioning risks into the financial system and into everyone's pockets and how we um, <clears throat> invest um, in this country and indeed around the world. Um, so in terms of the um, long-term strategy then, like we've been talking with our members about this. So thinking about it from an investor, institutional investor's point of view, um, what would we need from uh, the long-term strategy. Um, and I think the, the sort of the core element of it is that, as I've mentioned earlier, we have the Paris Agreement, we have a long-term signal from government. Basically, we want confidence that governments are going to build on that agreement and actually deliver what they've said to the market and to the international community um, and to the Australian community, which is deliver net zero emissions at some time, point in the future and agree on that as the UN goal. And ideally, agree on that for 2050 because that's what... Uh, the science says we need to do if we're going to meet the objectives of the Paris Agreement. Um, then what we also need to do is make sure that we're actually identifying a bit, like Frank said, both the technology pathways but also the sectoral pathways and the community pathways um, across the economy to actually manage the transition and to get near net zero emissions. So once we've got that clear plan, if you like, about how we're going to get there and noting that it's going to be uncertain, um, is that what that allows investors to do is to invest more efficiently. Um, so at the moment, a classic example would be that, you know, investors see renewable energy as a great investment opportunity. It's relatively low risk. Um, but at the moment, they're, they're sort of being a bit wary about what we do in the Australian market, investing in the US, Asia um, um, and Europe, um, because the, the government has put up the prospect of investing in a coal-fired generator, um, which is exactly the wrong direction if you're going to get net zero emissions, which creates uncertainty in the market, which means that investors will stay away until that... that that, that certainty is resolved. So we basically need a, a strategy that not only rules in technologies, but also one that rules out technology. So we have clarity about um, what investors <coughs> should be investing in. Um, and I think the other thing that is, is really important here is that what, that's, what that strategy would do if it's mapped out properly, it reduces the risk of stranded assets. Um, because this is the big problem that investors have at the moment. Like many of them are already excluding thermal coal um, because the, the risks are too high, a stranded asset risk. Um, but when you're getting down to individual big in infrastructure projects, for example, like things like investments in the national electricity market or investments in water um, infrastructure or investments in <coughs> transport infrastructure, um, having clarity about the long-term direction um, helps effectively price the risk that that might become stranded in the future and avoid um, making that investment or um, looking at a different investment. Um, so what we talked about amongst our members is sort of, the, sort of the, the principles which we thought would be useful for the government to approach in terms of the development of the policy. Um, one was to engage in extensive consultation. Um, and this is not just about, because what we've seen, I think, where successful transitions have started to happen has been a, a situation where, as opposed to the government going, saying, this is what we're going to do, we've already got the ideas, go and consult with us. Um, see, tell us what you think. They've actually gone into communities and they've said, um, we've, this is the problem we've got let's work together and work out how to fix it. Um, so having that, constant, that, that, that communication back and forth between core parts of the economy, but also um, particular communities and particular industries which will be affected by the transition is really, really important. Um, the other thing would be, would be to undertake scenario analysis. Like this has basically become bread and butter for investors now and increasingly for companies, thinking about how, what different possible futures could look like, because if we know anything with certainty, the, the analysis we do today is going to be wrong. So let's do some analysis around um, the different potential pathways and see what the risks and opportunities that go along with them. And a good example of this, I think, is the work that's done with the, um, the energy, sorry, the AEMO's um, integrated systems plan. 
where they test a whole bunch of different scenarios about possible energy futures and then test their investments that they're making in transmission and distribution against those, which then gives you a, a more robust picture of what the right pathway is going forward. Um, the other one is to build on existing public and private processes. So, for example, Anna um, and our group, for example, are, are involved in something called the Australian Sustainable Finance Initiative, which involves institutional investors, which I represent, but also the banks and the insurers, looking at ways in which we can unlock and, and um, investment in um, greening up the financial system and indeed the entire economy. Um, let's not reinvent the wheel. Let's draw from those kinds of processes, learn from them, um, include them in the long-term strategy. Um, now, Tenant, and, and I should have said earlier on that I'm, I'm glad I'm actually going before Tenant, because his slides are much better than mine. <laughs> um, but one point I'm going to reiterate is something that he says, is avoid an over-reliance on economic modelling. Not, it's not useful. No one believes it. <laughs> um, just get over it. <laughs> um, the last one is also ensuring consistency with the objectives of the Paris Agreement, of course. And I think from an investor point of view, one of the critical things that's often lost in this conversation is the need to integrate the physical impacts of climate change into this assessment as well. Um, so because there's no point building an entire hydrogen industry in the northwest of, of Western Australia if people aren't going to be allowed to go, can't go outside in summer because they'll die. So you have to be able to thinking about these things in terms of both the physical impacts of climate change but also um, the transition uh, that is underway. Uh, so I will leave it there and um, that's where you can find me. Thank you very much indeed, Irwin. Um, and there's every argument to be made that um, the decisions that are taken uh, by the finance industry are probably influencing things um, to a similar extent, if not more, than, uh, than near-term policies. Um, this is my chance to get 30 seconds in on, on economic modelling. I, 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 you know, I would say that, that Economic analysis and, and forming a firm understanding of economic opportunities and economic costs and economic risks is super important. Um, and economic modeling can help in that process. Right? What's not helpful is when there's an economic modeling scenario of 30 years out, right? and it says something goes up by 2.7% and something declines by 4.1%. You know, and people pretend that you know, this is somehow uh, a prediction of the future. That's, that's what needs to be avoided. Um, Tenant Reid, um, uh, Principal Advisor, I think your title is, right? Is that right? Head of Environment, Climate Change and Energy at the Australian industry group. Um, Tenant is actually, you know, for those of you who don't know, very well known in the international climate change negotiations as someone who, who really follows the issues um, to the very, very last uh, day, hour and minute of the negotiations. And in fact, he gave the closing statement for the uh, business NGOs at the, at the Madrid Climate Conference. But let's not dwell on, uh, on that and welcome Tenant. <laughs> Coincidentally, uh, I, uh, I don't think I've felt as tired uh, since Madrid as I do today after getting back into Melbourne at um, 2 a.m. yesterday. Uh, but I'm going to try to do my best. The slides will help. I don't know, I don't know if they've been built up too much. Um, what I want to talk about a bit, like I, I agree with a great deal, uh, with everything that has been said so far. Um, the Australian Industry Group represents businesses of all sizes around Australia, many sectors, a lot of manufacturing. Our um, organisation has adopted the goal of net zero emissions for Australia by 2050. Our members uh, discussed this uh, quite uh, extensively uh, late last year. Ultimately, our national uh, executive uh, unanimously decided to adopt that goal. It's not to say that we know exactly how that goal will be achieved. It's pretty clear how it can be achieved, but there are a lot of technology options and which are going to be the most uh, optimal, which economic and, um, and policy measures are going to be the best. We are going to have a lot of surprises on the way to finding that out. And what I want to talk about today is a little bit of uh, the, um, the room for surprise, the room for uncertainties, and uh, a certain amount of ranting about economic modelling. Um, so, 
a few points to make. It's not just our, our members. Net zero by 2050 is now a, a very widely supported goal, aspiration, target, direction, guiding light. People phrase it in, in different ways. They use it in different ways. Uh, but it, it, it is um, increasingly uncontroversial, despite the newspaper headlines of the last week or two, uh, among a, an awful lot of people out in stakeholder land. Uh, whatever it's like here. Uh, I, is ANU inside the Canberra bubble? Um, <laughs> ANU has now committed to become a negative emissions organisation. That's a very impressive commitment. Although it's a lot easier for you than it is for our members. <laughs> so don't forget that. Um, but having a clear end state is uh, to, to uh, work towards and vision towards is a lot more useful than uh, picking some intermediate target and having arguments about optimization towards 5% improvement in this or that. Ultimately, we're after a big transformation that brings, uh, a, that is successful, brings people along, uh, leaves us with uh, a, a more prosperous economy afterwards than we have going in. Uh, and we do need to look to think about end states in that. Net zero by some date is necessary for any temperature stabilisation goal. Uh, we have had, um, uh, our group is part of the Australian Climate Roundtable, which brings together a lot of uh, different organisations, some of them represented in this room today. Uh, we and our members shared some not super chipper uh, briefing on the state of uh, what climate science is saying we're, we're headed towards. And like 1.5 is, is like, I, I wouldn't be making plans based on we're definitely going to achieve 1.5. Uh, it's looking very, very hard. Um, but we do need to get to net zero. 2050 is a time frame that uh, this... Is this going to give me...? Yep. Uh, so this uh, figure is from the uh, Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change's special report on 1.5 degrees from 18 months ago. Uh, suggesting in a whole range of model pathways that they looked at that uh, for global um, average temperatures to be kept below two degrees, you'd need to hit global net zero around 2070. And uh, for 1.5 degrees, you'd need to hit that around 2050 with a bit of uncertainty range to either side. Now, these projections should not be taken as wholly writ any more than the more explicitly economic ones I'm going to get to in a minute, uh, because this is the um, product of a whole bunch of different integrated assessment models which try to interface between what the physical science can tell us and what we imagine we know about technology and economics and politics and society. And the chances are, based on the... Um, the things that um, senior figures from the IPCC were saying at the last couple of, um, of conferences where I, I, I saw them speak, uh, the next wave of this, this kind of assessment that we'll probably see uh, late next year and early 2022 in the sixth assessment report, these pathways could look significantly different in their makeup, maybe in their timing, very likely in the, the sequencing of what action looks optimal when. Because these are a product of assumptions about what various technologies cost, and hugely they are a product of particular discount rate settings. And uh, anybody who hasn't spent a lot of time um, grumbling about discount rates, it sounds super arcane. It tends to be, uh, you know, if you had to pick one assumption feeding into one of these exercises that can transform the whole thing, that's, that's probably the one. The next round of, um, of modelling for these assessments will probably be inadequate in all kinds of ways, and I'll, I'll get to one of those in a minute, but uh, it is going to use much lower discount rates, which, for instance, may mean 
that the model pathways produce much less reliance on negative emissions. Yeah, yeah. I'll speed it up. Uh, negative emissions uh, later on and much more reliance on doing stuff in the nearer term. So let's watch that space. All right, um, so modelling, it's bad. Um, I can spend a lot of time talking about why it's so bad. Uh, we're not going to get to day 700, but just as an example of why it's so bad, uh, this was um, shooting around on Twitter recently. Uh, it's, it's great. Uh, check it out. It's, uh, it gets peaceable uh, economists very angry to look at this chart. Uh, so this is, the black line is the most recent International Energy Agency projections of where capital costs for solar PV in China, as just one example, will go over the next few decades. Uh, for, um, for the record, there are a bunch of projects actually being done well below that already. Um, these are the cost pathways that are built into all of the most widely used integrated assessment models that are producing these pathways uh, that the IPCC is assessing uh, and are still the default being built into the next round of assessments for the next big report. Uh, so they're just, it, there's bad data going in. It's really hard to address innovation properly in the models. Uh, and every single asterisk or, or um, qualification gets lost the instant a number gets reported out the other side. Uh, so we should just be, it's, it is, I agree, a useful tool for a sober consideration of what are some of the dynamics in different policy pathways. The problem is nobody does that. The only thing people use these models for in practice is to produce a number to say that something is good or bad. And it just can't bear the weight that we're putting on it. Um, so similarly, our expectations of how hard a target is going to be to meet, like we really need to be cautious about that too. We have had, uh, you know, for a long time, projection after projection after projection of Australia's business as usual, if we don't get policy sorted out, uh, emissions pathway. And the black line is what emissions have kept doing. We've just built this hedgehog year after year, more quills always going upwards again, um, while stuff in the real economy was just changing. So um, again, the, the, the size of the task, uh, it's, not a, it's not a static thing, it's not an easily, easily knowable thing. Um, let's not be too confident that the latest set of projections are, uh, of, of business as usual emissions are any more correct. And that may, may well mean, I know that there are probably people in the room who have their doubts about the meet and beat uh, targets in a canter uh, kind, of, kind of rhetoric that is heard from time to time. Um, but like, if you're looking at this, then kind of looking very suspiciously at the, the latest um, lines and saying, yeah, we probably will come under those, like that's, that's pretty reasonable. It also suggests that going well below may be easier than we think. Um, and just a few words then on the process of planning. So uh, there's a remark attributed to uh, Eisenhower when he was uh, running, when he was the supreme commander of allied forces in Western Europe. The plan is nothing, planning is everything. The process of uh, developing long-term strategies and updating them uh, as we go can be an extremely useful one, even if the tools that we have to vision out to the long-term are pretty weak. Um, there's a, I, I see a lot of argument about whether we have time for um, letting the, uh, the unknown play out, allowing for surprises, if we need to just pick things and make huge investments over the next 10 years and just make it happen. And it's true that there's not a lot of investment cycles for many industries between now and 2050. Um, change, change might have to be like pretty big pretty soon. But at the same time, um, our level of confidence that we know which are going to be the best solutions for everything should not be that high. Ten years ago, more modelling reports were suggesting that um, hot, dry rocks geothermal was going to be a huge part of the electricity future, and that was going to be the cheapest low emissions technology, maybe next to uh, coal with carbon capture and storage. 
those projections don't look too good right now. But similarly, I, I'm, I'm very happy to believe that uh, variable wind and solar are going to be a gargantuan part of our energy future. But we should remember that there are very enthusiastic people, many of them very vocal on Twitter, uh, who can tell you a lot about next generation nuclear or uh, alum cycle um, combustion with potentially much lower CCS costs. And while the current versions of those technologies do not look particularly interesting from a cost or uh, feasibility point of view, we probably should think about um, retaining room for surprise because the law of surprise, uh, for anybody who's been watching The Witcher, uh, is one that we is always passed. Uh, not, not, every, not everything passes the parliament, but the law of surprise definitely does. So we need to develop a plan. We need to be ready to update it a lot. We need to start the journey, but we shouldn't be too sure that we know exactly where we're going to wind up or how we're going to get there. Uh, thank you very much, Tennant. And uh, I'll ask all of our uh, presenters and speakers to take a seat up front and we'll uh, We'll take, we, we've got between 20 and 25 minutes for, um, for Q&A and, and, and discussion in the room. So uh, please indicate to me uh, if, if you'd like the floor and I'll keep, keep, keep a little tally, tally there. Um, so, uh, Tennant, you mentioned Twitter. Um, I, think, I think all of us are on Twitter, so follow us if you want to keep um, uh, involved. It's really useful because you know, a lot of people put on Twitter what's, what's on their mind currently, so that's actually a very, very useful um, tool. I'd, I'd like to start you off by sharing your thoughts of how important is it in relative terms for, for, for a jurisdiction, whether it's, be, whether it's national or subnational, um, to have an emissions target versus having a plan for achieving it, uh, a strategy, right? Um, the two things, target versus strategy. Can you do one without the other? Um, and what's the relevant, uh, relative importance of the two? And I'll, I'll take your indications as to who would like to jump in next. I will have a go at that one. Uh, yeah, I will have a go at that one. So uh, that they are both important. Um, ultimately, uh, you, you do need both. You've got to start somewhere, and whether people, uh, you know, start by seeing what they think they can do, and then consider how far they can take that, or vice versa. I, I, I don't know that we should be jumping down anyone's throat for starting on this journey. Uh, but uh, ultimately, yes, you do need both. Um, I'd agree with Tennant, but I think the other important caveat I'd put about it from, which goes to the point which I raised around, I think the way that the central banks are thinking about this issue and how investors are thinking about this issue is that the, the transition is inevitable. Um, so if, if, it, if, the t if the plan you're putting forward and the target you're putting forward aren't seen as being credible in the long term, then that in itself creates increases risk for investors. So, and that's why, um, from an investor's point of view, having a target that's embedded in the objectives of the Paris Agreement is actually quite useful, and hence 2050, um, sorry, net zero by 2050 is quite useful. Yeah, okay. We've got a question here. Tom? Tom Long? Uh, yeah, my question was for Owen, um, because back in the day, many, many years ago, I used to work for Apple, mm -hmm. uh, and they had a worst case <laughs> risk assessment that is part of their profiles for all the truth. Uh, which is a very interesting assessment, especially for truth that are very industry-specific. Mm. I was wondering if you could just talk about some of those really interesting activities that investors are doing that are really meaningful to have some of the uh, climate change and the impacts and whether it's things like that. I will usually quickly paraphrase the questions just for the recording that we're doing because we're not using microphones. So the question is about risk assessment uh, for, for investors. Um, well, they, yes, the investors are doing a lot of different things. Um, and they're actually, they're all doing it in their own way because their portfolios are different um, and the approaches they take in are different. Um, and in some respects, that's part of the problem. Um, and that's partly why we're encouraging the government to do a long-term strategy and to actually do some things, particularly on the, the physical risk side, where, because at the moment, you've basically got the big 
investors who can afford to spend a large amount of money to do undertake a risk assessment, for example, of the portfolio of their assets to climate change risk. Um, but the smaller players in the market uh, don't necessarily have the resources. And if they do, um, they're all using different scenarios. So this is where the role of governments can come in quite useful in sort of defining um, some clear scenarios going forward which we can test against. And that is where I think the work that the central banks are doing globally and which is starting to emerge here in Australia is, becomes really important. So like APRA the other day just said that they're going to stress test the banks um, and put out some scenarios to how they're managing physical climate and, and transition risks. And why I think this is actually really important is not just from the point of view that the regulators are doing it and they're doing it globally, but I also think that they're actually using their core competencies and basically looking at the work that's been done on the economic modelling of transition, like whether the, what the IEA has been doing, what's been done by the scientific community, and translating that into real things that investors can use. Um, and also, but not actually just relying on models. Like, you know, they, to, to quote one central banker who said to me the other day, the IEA's analysis is rubbish. And, um, because it doesn't help investors and in, in those agencies to actually do the work that they need to do. And they actually also understand, I think, some of the limitations that's done on the, on the physical risk side. So they're including much more severe economic costs from climate change than you would generally get out of the CG models that we all use to look at climate change impacts. Mm. Erwin, do we see a convergence in methods to, um, to assess climate change impact risks? Um, we'll see a, a good picture of that in April when where our expectation is that the, the network of central banks will release their global scenarios, which will then be used by each central bank at a national level to then translate that into scenarios for those jurisdictions. Yeah. Question in the middle here. I would like to ask this question. Uh, so in the process of uh, modelling future emission scenarios, uh, do you uh, consider the emerging socio-economic system models like sharing economy? Because instead of having many EVs, but lesser EVs fulfilling the mobility requirements in future with equal amount of cars, how do you consider that? Yes. So question to Anna on the relative role of uh, technical, economic and social modelling, perhaps you want to phrase it that way. Yes, we absolutely do. Uh, there's not a huge amount of... Uh, data in the sense of a set of agreed sort of known futures about that, trends that are easily predictable. Uh, but particularly in relation to vehicles, we looked in depth at uh, all, the, all the literature and, and market reports around autonomous vehicles as well as electric. So, so there's the, how does the car change and how does the use of the car change? And that includes ride share. Um, but, but it's also not just transport where, where we're seeing a business model shift to say transport as a service. Energy as a service is also emerging um, where uh, rather than the own, owner of the asset of a centralised asset and selling the units and then on-site customers also needing to own their own equipment if you need heating and cooling in your um, you know, university campus, for example. Some of the large energy companies are looking at offering it that as a service, so they can they can be the ones to say, you know what, LED lights have improved so much, it's time to upgrade yours, because that's better for everyone. And 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 so there's an emerging shift in those sorts of business models. The way it plays out in a, in an ultimate modelling sense is, we ran a scenario where we we where we we took some judgments, which will all be published on. How much uh, would autonomous... See, the thing with autonomous vehicles is it could go either way. You could have a lot more driving. And so if you haven't had the decarbonisation of electricity, then that driving adds to emissions. Um, or you can have a lot less if there's other modal shift around mass transit, for example. So um, it, it's why scenarios are really, really important. No one can know which one will be right. So um, as Tennant said, what it enables you to do is just to be transparent and say, if... It's, it goes that way, then it affects everything else in, like this. And if it goes that way, the effect is different. What's common across them, and therefore we can make a judgement around taking some no regrets actions or taking risk management actions um, or trying to steer towards one outcome rather than another when you see what the results of it are. So these sorts of modelling suites allow all of that consideration. 
a little footnote on the emissions intensity of electric cars. So the proper consideration is, of course, not the average grid intensity at this point in time, but the emissions intensity of the additional electricity supply that's needed to charge your car. Okay, And so the two things can be very different, and in Australia are actually very, very different. Um, and if we put the existing vehicle fleet or large share of it on electricity, we're talking about an enormous uh, delta there in terms of uh, additional electricity supply, which, which can come entirely from, from zero carbon sources. Also, there's data to show that autonomous vehicles themselves uh, bring energy efficiency improvements. So uh, they, the machine drives the car better than the human does from um, engine efficiency perspective. Uh, and so we can, we can include that as well in the modelling and see whether it's offset by perhaps more use of those vehicles. There's quite, there's quite a lot of data to play with. Yeah. Next question is by Penn Howarth. By the way, feel free to introduce yourselves if you like when you ask your question. Yes. So, hi, I'm Penn Howarth, um, a researcher at UNA who wants to comment on current affairs and trade. Now, first step, I'm going to looking at how we can accelerate um, exports of zero emissions energy fuels from Australian products. Um, so I, there are going to need to be some massive investments if we're to build uh, future export industries um, that are for Australia to remain an energy superpower. I, I thought it was great when you mentioned um, the physical risks of putting in large-scale uh, energy installations in areas that may be uninhabitable in the future. I'm just uh, wondering how will investors be able to make the sorts of decisions, bold decisions, large decisions, to, to um, finance those new industries when there's so much uncertainty around? And, and what role will defending can governments uh, play to facilitate the right sorts of decisions being made for that. So question about future energy infrastructure, including possibly for renewables-based um, uh, exports and, and the role that uncertainty, including about climate change impacts, plays in that. Um, I think it, it's for all of you, actually. And I will pass to Erwin in a moment. I wanted to respond on, on the, the process of how and the uncertainty point. There's, there's always discussion about the level of uncertainty and a, and, and a sense that there's very high level of uncertainty in relation to anything to do with climate change and decarbonisation scenarios. But when you think about running a business, um, there is a business as usual amount of uncertainty in any uh, set of commercial investments that are made. No business has perfect knowledge of its, the future demand for its product. It's true, some are more predictable than others, but I think we've seen since the digital revolution that um, the era of disruption is now the new normal. And so the art of managing uncertainty is a core business skill. It's not a reason not to act. It redefines the questions you ask. It redefines the way you look at data, for example, scenarios rather than single path. Uh, but it doesn't prevent decisions. Um, it, it certainly articulates the risk assessment and how you assess risk in making that decision. Um, but it's those sorts of uh, tools have been used right throughout uh, business and corporate history. To the more granular question of how do you go about making a hard decision, such as the ones you suggested of a large investment, um, I mentioned we're working with the Energy Transitions Commission, which is a global group of um, uh, business-led, uh, the commissioners are all uh, businesses and um, research institutes, including, for example, the chairman of Rio Tinto and HSBC are there and many, many other, uh, you know, Tata and Schneider and uh, industrial large companies. And uh, they are coming together as a group to just look at these questions collectively, get the analysis. They've got Rocky Mountain Institute and McKinsey and all sorts of analysts. And then they're looking at what are the possible commercial scenarios, what are the diplomatic scenarios, all that sort of stuff, and just gathering it, debating collectively, and then producing a sort of a best case, you know, uh, not a conclusion, just a this is the synthesis of, of that exploration. And then all the businesses individually are better informed and go and make their own decisions based on their particular strengths, weaknesses, competitive advantages and, and the like. So there are, there are ways that governments can support that by making some of the information that Erwin um, talked about uh, more easily att attainable, for example. Um, but the National Hydrogen Strategy is a great example of a, of a process and a, and a set of analysis that highlights those questions and creates the ability for um, 
alliances to now explore the, the parts of it that are relevant to them. And the World Economic Forum, my last point here, is hosting a new platform off the back of that work, the Mission Possible platform, which is where companies are coming together. So the shipping industry, cars, steel, aviation, companies who are saying, we're, we're affected by this. So if ships are going to be carbon neutral, is it going to be ammonia made from hydrogen? Where, where will we refuel? Which ports can have that? Where should the port refuelling? Does everyone need a hydrogen? Would the route change? All those kind of questions, right? So they have convened themselves. There's banks, shipping makers, the engine manufacturers, the port owners, and they're discussing it together. And I think really the lesson for that is now it's, it's just time to be at the table and, and help you know, be in the discussion, ask the questions, and, and the information can, can be part of that. Um, I don't know, Tennis, before we get to jump in on this one as well. <laughs> um, I'd probably say a, a couple of things. Um, like at a macro level, uh, the way investors will look at this is, and, this, and I'm, I'll just keep bringing this back to the long-term strategy. Like, as we move forward over the next few years, um, investors will be assessing um, how the world is going on climate change. And that if they see we're on a four degree trajectory, they will then withdraw capital from where areas that they think are the most vulnerable. And I wouldn't want to be in Australia in that situation. And they will start putting into areas where they think that they can actually survive in that, in that kind of future. If we're on a one and a half degree trajectory, that becomes less of an issue and they'll be focused more on the opportunities that come out with, um, the, in the transition itself. Like I think the core thing that I keep hearing from my members is that the value of the long-term strategy is that it can actually, as I think has been mentioned by a few people, is it actually brings people to the table to think about how we can solve exactly the problem that you've got. Because each building a piece of infrastructure kit in one particular pass or a particular technology is going to have its own challenges. And there's, there'll be, there will be a role for different parts of the investment chain in that. Um, so it's about bringing the, the people to the table. The other core thing is just some stability. At the moment, investors are people, um, and people are risk adverse. If you stick your hand on the fire and it gets burnt, you're not going to stick your hand back on the fire. And that's how many investors view the Australian energy market. So let's have some stability about policy settings and a bipartisan commitment to net zero by 2050 from that point of view would be quite useful. And then we can work out a plan collectively about how we're going to get there and the role that investors can play. Uh, just specifically on one form of the, the opportunity and, and how to get there, which is um, hydrogen exports. Hydrogen uh, could be the answer to a bunch of problems. There are competitors for all of those those niches. Um, but if it's going to get there, like currently electrolysis hydrogen is very expensive. It's very expensive for hydrogen and hydrogen is very expensive as a source of, of energy to, to do energy stuff. Um, if it's going to get down the cost curve, an awful lot of capacity for, of electrolyzers is going to have to get built that will be expensive. And it's a very similar challenge to um, wind and solar, uh, and uh, whether it's somebody volunteering to be the, the equivalent of Germany uh, as Germany was to solar, uh, to be that to electrolyzers, money vomiting subsidies for which the rest of the world can be greatly grateful because it pushes the technology down that curve. But somebody's going to have to do it, whether it's on the supply side, subsidising supply, or price insensitive demand. Um, it, it plausibly can get way down the curve, but it's not going to be cheap to start with, and you don't get anywhere if you don't start. Uh, I'll just add a little on the, um, the, the scientific sort of side of, of things, and we've heard about sort of the, the problems with economic modelling, um, but I think we also need to bear in mind that there are issues with our climate modelling as well, and so one of the things that I think we need to be um, prepared for is that we are seeing some aspects of the, ch the climate changing faster than what we expected. So, for example, um, in the IPCC report on the ocean and cryosphere last year, we saw sea level rise estimates going up by 10% um, for the end of the century. Um, that's the type of thing that we can expect to see, see more of. Um, the initial indications of the current round of climate models is that they have a higher temperature sensitivity than what was used for the basis of the 1.5 degree report. And so we may be expecting that we'll hit 1.5 and 2 degrees sooner than what we expected. Um, and the other, the other aspect that sort of I wanted to point out from the climate science point of view is that 
we are aware that um, one of the things that we like to do as scientists is to, to look at a range of um, possibilities for a different scenario and give you the, the average answer. What's the middle of the road? Um, but that's probably not something that's particularly useful for, for um, investment where you actually want to know what are your risks and what are your high-end risks. And so that's one of the other things that um, climate scientists are increasingly trying to provide that information of what are the, the potential for some of these um, these risks that are probably a low probability of happening, but if they did happen, they would have a very high impact. Uh, we're coming toward the end of our allocated time, and I'm a little worried the lights might go off again. So <laughs> we'll, we'll take the next and final two questions together. We had one question in the middle here, and then Ken Baldwin. Um, two quick questions. Um, how realistic is green forest cover stain in for carbon sequestration? Um, if the forests keep burning down, the temperatures keep going up. And um, what potential is there for airlines to reduce their carbon emissions, uh, particularly for Australia, given our geological size, uh, geographic size and location? Very long swim in Europe and America, so we're not going to stop flying. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Ken Baldwin, well, I'm directly then going into the that yeah. So um, we've heard a lot about uh, having a sort of macro plan where you have targets and trajectories going forward. Uh, my question is more about central planning in the kind of Eisenhower sense we heard about before. Um, so one of the things that's going to stop us from getting to where we need to get to, given that Australia is installing solar in the fastest way of any country practically, is the fact that we don't have the infrastructure in place to cope with it. And uh, there's been a, you know, a general sense in the past that you uh, leave the market to decide on where this has to go and all this sort of thing. And that's fine if you've got a trajectory plan, you know, you say that you've got targets to hit and you leave the market to hit it and that drives down the cost of finance and it makes things a lot easier. It doesn't necessarily work when you've got a monopolistic infrastructure. So my question is, are we shifting now from a world which is all free enterprise and let, you know, the capitalist economy run things, back to more a central planning uh, economy in some circumstances, i.e. Like infrastructure, because we've got to get to an end point that we know it has to be rich. And, uh, and so therefore, you cannot leave it up to so-called markets, but it's only often one or maybe two parts. Okay, so um, I'd encourage each of you to respond to whichever points you want to respond to in a, in a final round. Um, so uh, questions were reforestation, aviation, and uh, the role of planning and government-driven investment approaches. Please. Um, I'll go to the last one. Um, and I, th you know, I think it's fair to say that given um, I represent the finance industry, a, a simple carbon price is probably what they would love. Um, <laughs> But I think there's also a recognition and a realisation that, A, that's not the direction that most governments are going now. Uh, increasingly, we are seeing interventions from governments in markets um, to, in terms of to address this challenge. And I also think there's a level of pragmatism about it also in that there's a recognition that if we are going to get to net zero by 2050, it's going to have to be a partnership between the private sector and, and government. And, um, and this is the... Part, this is the tragedy in some respects of the current climate policy conversation we have in Australia. It's become so politicised, um, we stick our head above the parapet and say we need a long-term plan, and we get a, someone to fly us back politically, oh, I'll keep you, shut up, you don't know what you're talking about, you're not representing the Australian people, blah, 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 blah. So we've actually got to the point in Australian politics where it's actually become really hard to have that conversation, and I'm hoping that the long-term strategy is an opportunity to do that. I think the other thing I just wanted to say, um, which is a related point, and then I'll shut up, is that um, we're actually about to head into a very um, intense, I think, climate policy conversation in Australia over the next little while. And I just want to caution people in that every time we have this conversation, we make the, um, the perfect the, the enemy of the good. And we need to find a way to come together on this issue and start thro stop throwing stones at each other. And I can see Twitter being a classic example of that, and I'm <laughs> I regret ever getting on it. But... <laughs> but <laughs> um, and I think this is, this is a, forums like this are an opportunity to start the conversation because at the end of the day, we've all got to come together to solve this problem because none of us can solve it by ourselves.
Uh, so a couple of points on, on, on both things. Uh, in the energy space in particular, there's a real tug of war at the moment between market approaches and planning approaches. And at the moment, we're caught between the two stools, like flat on our back, rolling with our legs in the air. Nothing is working. Uh, we uh, have market uh, underlying market design that relies on price signals being allowed to work. We don't. All of us don't like the price signals lately, and governments are intervening, but they're not intervening to such an extent that they're actually taking over. They're just doing bit by bit interventions, and they can't even agree amongst themselves on what they really want to do, nor resource themselves to be all seeing um, planners. So we've got to pick some mix and commit to it. Um, uh, on the, the question of uh, reforestation and uh, airlines, these both go to the issue of things that we can do with bio stuff, which I'm going to very technically call it. Like we can do biofuels, we can do uh, bioplastics, we can do sequestration uh, in uh, forests, we can do carbon negative by raising energy crops burning them in power plants and sequestering the carbon. We can do a lot of stuff, but there is only so much sustainably producible biomass, and we're not going to be able to do all of those things at a scale that is going to be efficient and make sense. And I have not the least idea which are going to be the best uses of what we can do. So I could add to that um, very helpful summary on the aviation question. The the bio stuff you're referring to comes from a, a basket of um, activities which are, em the, the language emerging is nature-based solutions, which covers quite a broad range. And that there are some wonderful uh, co-benefits, what policy boffins say, whereas actually often they're the core benefits for those of us outside the carbon world, really. Um, so very much worth investing in. The, the risk of, some, of fires, as we've seen in forestry, it's real, but what the carbon forestry sector is saying is that actively managed uh, forestry and, ve and vegetation for carbon, um, you know, whether it's plantation or mixed vegetation, um, has increased our ability to understand fire management as well. And so we, we whilst we know there's an increasing risk, we can also um, have increasing management uh, as we have more land under management for forestry and carbon sequestration. So we can get the win-win there, as well as the soil carbon and biodiversity at the same time. To Tennant's point about, therefore, what are the land use trade-offs uh, that uh, decisions are, need to be made on how best to use that land? The evidence, or at least analysis, that we've looked at shows that in most studies, aviation uh, becomes the top buyer of what can be produced in terms of biofuels, because for long-haul flights, there is as yet no other known solution. And we know biofuels can work. Qantas has flown uh, fully uh, biofuel-powered jets in Australia. Um, so, that, so in terms of who would want to pay the most for the, the land that would produce the biofuel, it, it's likely to be aviation until a substitute is found. The electric aviation substitute looks viable for short haul, and that may work for Southeast Asia where there's a lot of island hopping and would work domestically here. Um, and there's some great promise there. That, that they don't need as much runway. The, the electric planes can sort of go up and down much more quickly and quietly. So you can actually um, have more airports and refuel them with hydrogen potentially on site. There's quite an interesting emerging ecosystem around that. So um, there is a lot more analysis around biofuels and carbon sequestration and some great potential there. Uh, and my team are working on a multi-year integrated an, an analysis piece because it's, it's quite complex to try and optimise for all of those. But it's quite promising what can be done. And even there's a global study that shows that you can meet the biofuels needs and the food needs and the biodiversity needs and still free up land to protect for species protection if all the other things go well. So then you've got to do full press on food waste and efficient production and all those other things. So again, it's back to that approach of making sure the full mix is at play. Um, I'll just add a little as well on the, the forest um, question and, and I guess more generally in terms of the, the way that we can um, potentially offset uh, some, some emissions, so forest is one of those. 
Um, I think one thing that we have seen this summer and that we really need to take into account here is that climate change has the potential to alter the potential of those different areas that we have for trying to respond to climate change. So, um, so we can um, look at forests as a way of drawing down carbon, but if at the same time by increasing um, bushfire risk, um, we, we can be um, seeing bushfires that are unstoppable, and so then we end up with this situation where that's a, a less effective um, mechanism for drawing down carbon. Another example um, would be mangroves, which have been um, talked about as a potential uh, way of drawing down blue carbon, um, storing, storing that. Uh, but, but the potential of those is also affected by marine heat waves and by rising uh, sea levels. So, so we have this trade-off between these different natural options that we could look at, but also how they may be of diminishing effect because of the impacts of climate change as well. Okay, that brings today's discussion to an end. It's an ongoing conversation and there will be many more opportunities to hear about these things at ANU. If you aren't already, you may want to get on the mailing lists of the ANU Climate Change Institute, the ANU Energy Change Institute, and of course the Center for Climate and Energy Policy here at Crawford School. Thank you very much for coming, for taking part, and please thank once again uh, our speakers.